Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, we're in the Quaker House in Ottawa, and we have 18 people here, and uh, hopefully some people online. 50, hello, 50. Um, where we'll do a, a meditation for 45 minutes. I'll give some guided meditation, but let's just use much of the time for silence. And then after that, I shall give a demo talk. So let's go for it. <clears throat> Great. So take a posture that you can hold comfortably. Is my sound all right? Yeah, everything's good. <clears throat> And just bring attention to the room, to where you're sitting, and begin by listening to sound. Just listen to sound. And let the sounds come to you. It doesn't really matter what the sound is. So we can call this receptive listening. And when you listen, you also notice the silence of the mind. So I can hear the traffic in the background lightly, but also I can notice the silence of the mind. No thought. So try to return to the silence of just knowing the way things are by using an object like sound, but not referencing the sound, rather referencing the silence itself, the silence of no thought, the silence of the mind. So listen to sound. And that silence isn't something that you manufacture, it's always there. The sound can change, but the silence won't. So be that, be that silent awareness. Now, now as you do that, you can notice that you maybe trying to do something or find something. And that's an object where silence isn't an object. It's just the background. So the foreground is the sound of the traffic for me, for you, a different sound, but the foreground is the movement. And in the background is the silence. Now change the sense door, as we say. So feel your hands. Feel the warmth and pressure of your hands. The tactile feeling. Now that's different than the sound. But the silence is still there. Uh, notice the sound and notice that sound is in awareness or perceive that sound is in awareness. Now feel your hands. Perceive your hands are, the feelings in the hands are in awareness. So silent awareness contains these things, they come and they go. The hand, feelings change, sounds come and go. And the background is the silent awareness, the silent knowing, the silent consciousness. And that's what we're trying to reference, remember. Because that's where we find peace. So the, tra the challenge is thought, even though you might kind of get, it's kind of easy to understand, the thinking mind just churns up memories and plans and so on and so forth. So when you notice that you're thinking, don't try to get rid of thought, but just stop and notice the silence of the background by listening, just listen. 
So you're not trying to get rid of thought. Thought comes and goes. But you're also not just pursuing it. Thought is an object in awareness as well. Comes and goes. So that's the principle that I use. And then if you want an object of awareness to remind you of the silent awareness, you can use the breath. So if you feel the breath now, feel an in-breath and feel an out-breath. And notice the silence of awareness. So it's not really about the breath, but the breath sort of anchors you. So one in-breath is the silent knowing. One out-breath is silent consciousness. So we're not trying to attain or get anything or get rid of anything even. We're just remembering there's this silent awareness which knows how things come and go. So you'll have your own meditations, but try to keep that principle of background foreground as, as a reflection and remember the background, come to the background of silent awareness. Okay, so let's just sit quietly now. <clears throat>
So when you get caught up with thinking, <clears throat> and don't try to get rid of thought, but just listen, let the sounds come to you. Notice the silence of the mind, of awareness. Keep coming back to that until that dominates. So the first arising of thought, quite often we're, we think we have to fix it or do something about it, or we just get lost in it. But thought does come and go as an object. They're trying to see thought as an object rather than be the subject of our thinking. And when you notice this thinking, then there's also silence, actually. Silence of knowing. And to heighten that, if you just listen to sound, you heighten the silence, the silence of awareness.
So this takes a lot of patience. It's a kind of repetitive remembering. And I suggest that you just trust in the silent awareness rather than trying to figure something out or trying to get somewhere, trying to get rid of something. Just notice the silent awareness through listening and just open up to a sense of trust. It's like this, you're trusting in awareness. Then you get caught up again and then you remember and then just you come back to something very, very simple, trusting in awareness by noticing the silence of no thought, the space between thought.
Can stay, you stand up one time. Let me put this and I will be both sides. Thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. Yes, Nicole. He understands kind of what people want. But their nuclear bomb could explode. Your antagonistic sexualized people. You know what? Oh, uh, please call me Jack. And I promise you, I would like nothing better than to prepare a few of our new delicacies for you. Uh, uh, Kathy, I'm serving lunch in less than two hours. We won't be gone, man. It is a trip. This is Jack. Keep something hot. Uh, 
Thank you, Nicole.
I hear the bell on that. Yep. Mira, are you doing the honors? Shalom, <laughs> Namo tassa pakawato rahato samma samputassa Namo tassa pakawato rahato samma samputassa Namo tassa pakawato arahato samma samputassa Uttang damang sankang namasami So a few Dhamma reflections some ideas for your practice. I've just been on a road trip from Rome to Lisbon. Not bad. <laughs> we have a monastery outside of Rome called Santa Chitarama, and there was a uh, function there. We had 90 monks coming for the gathering, and then uh, some friends rented a car from Singapore and not the car, the people <laughs> were from Singapore and Malaysia, very good friends. And we drove to Firenze and then to Cinque Terre and Avignon and San Sebastian, Salamanca. And then we have a monastery near Lisbon, Sumedha Rama. So that was nice. Um, Anyway, <laughs> you talk about Buddhism. When, when we uh, ref refer to the teachings of the Buddha, there are many aspects, obviously. And so apparently when the Buddha wandered in the countryside, if he, the first thing he would talk about was generosity uh, because the generous spirit is so very important in just living a, a decent human life. And... So there's a lot of teachings around developing generosity in various ways. We talk about um, a life which was filled with uh, sensitivity to other creatures. So nonviolence, non-corruption, honesty, things like that, fidelity, sobriety, as ways of living in the society that was one of the ways it's talked about is it's a kind of to practice nonviolence, first precept, is giving beings the freedom from fear. If a being knows, like the deer at Tisarna, they're pretty much sure we're not going to eat them. So they hang around. They eat our compost. But you can, sense, you can see, you just sense that. They're, I mean, they're fear-bound beings anyway, but since we, so we're giving something to the deer, uh, freedom from fear. And then also like not, not appropriating things which don't belong to us. So uh, in a monastery, we, we rarely lose anything. We don't have to lock our doors. Uh, we do have a safe. <laughs> So the donations are protected and so on. So we, and we have to be streetwise, but you can see that if we, if our, the neighbors know that we are not gonna take their tools and they know 
we know they're not going to take their tools we we have a kind of freedom from fear um fidelity to being honest and faithful in relationships freedom from being cheated on um sobriety what could be more fearful than a person who's inebriated it's you know intelli- their intelligence just drops massively um uh, and then in speech which is which is um beautiful speech which is harmonious speech which is useful speech which is uplifting uh, frees us from the kinds of fears we might have of being shamed or hurt by speech or abused by speech that's one way of looking at the precept structures we're 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 offering this to other beings rather than a a moral code where we're in some sense we're afraid to break the code rather it comes from a generous place um and and of course it's a foundation for any kind of peaceful life without that the mind just has is too much um guilt or doubt so there's a lot in in the teachings about that and then and then a lot about like right livelihood how to live how to make a a living in a way which is not harmful but protects the family allows the family to be uh, well educated and well fed and so on um i'm not very good on right livelihood i mean i am <laughs> but i don't know how to describe it because i've been a monk all my life i can't get the general picture but those are kinds of things that it's good for like lay people to you know talk about what is right livelihood and when different kinds of moral dilemmas come up in in your livelihood if you have a a system of friendships that's so very important so one of the things that buddha really emphasized was kalyana mitta spiritual friendships you know friendships which are 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 real and and you can talk real things and are supportive and have have a basis of of dharma has to have a basis of of truth in them and that is very much like in the monastic tales of the buddha in terms of the monastic code and yeah, the buddha is asked what is oh, how i think venerable ananda is asked how much of the holy life is spiritual friendship and uh, ananda i think he answers like 50% and the buddha says no 100% and spiritual friendships are so so valuable and for one thing like say as a monastic i have other monastics around me and we have a certain ethos and a certain deportment and a certain uh, way of speech and uh, we have certain agreements that we've made and so if any one of us is starting to just get you know very selfish or 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 depressed or whatever it is the whole community carries that not not through any one individual but through all of us surrendering to something which is bigger than us that's that's monastic life but kalyana mitta spiritual friendship oh so so very important so then the, and then the teaching often talks about the psychological aspects of mind which we're all working on how to reduce the amount of fear how to understand fear in the mind how to reduce the amount of anger and aversion how to deal with resentments on a larger scale how to deal with child abuse and all these different things that um our our we as individuals in our culture deals with so in many ways we're very, very lucky now that the advances in good psychology are addressing things like like child abuse or alcoholism and all these these different professions that we have um so that's very very important um and then if if you know if the buddha thought that people people understood that this ground this ground of work that that needs to be done um then he would talk about teachings on liberation and obviously that's what i'm interested in i'm interested in all of it but i, th- I think i've got the other down <laughs> so liberation then is a quite an inviting word in the liberation freedom um there in in when you when you start to 
touch the silence of the mind. That I think is a big advance in in your spiritual practice because if the mind is always just um, preoccupied with thoughts and planning, mostly with the past and future, with a sense of self, then that preoccupation means that you're not available to a deeper understanding of what consciousness is. So when I, in this little meditation that I offered, um, I think it's not too difficult to notice the silence of consciousness. It's not. And it's not something you manufacture. And it's not something that's, it doesn't really depend on the traffic noise. Sure, if we had the football team now in autumn playing, then the sound would be much louder. Some of us have been here when there's a lot of Yahoo and you know, you know that kind of stuff. But still, it's just sound. It's just sound. It's more attractive or distracting. But that's what the mind is doing. But it's still just sound. And the silence of the mind is there irrespective of the quality of sound, which isn't to say if there's a massive explosion, we're going to do something about it. Or if someone is screaming for help, we're obviously going to do something about it. So it's not saying that we're just somehow passive, but just to indicate that in the flow of sense experience, although there is movement, there's also non-movement. There's also stillness. And I like to portray that as the foreground and background. And you can, you can do that with any sense base. You can, uh, you can taste a Mars bar. I had a Mars bar this morning, so I think it's morning. <laughs> and you taste a Mars bar and say, well, I haven't had these since I was a kid. Yeah, that's thought. But you can have the taste of sweetness and then there's still the silence of knowing. Huh? You can think I want a third Mars bar or a fourth Mars, I didn't. But, uh, you'd probably forget about the silence of the mind and just be absorbed. I mean, this is facetious and overdone, but that absorption into sense experience, which happens more in, in social media or in, in video games, I suppose, or in sexual experiences or all, all manner of very strong sensual experience. There's nothing wrong with that, but you can see that the mind is very preoccupied, very preoccupied with sense experience. So um, then an emotion, say, you have emotion like fear or strong resentment, you've been hurt by someone, or that's also an object. And just like the sound of the traffic is an object in awareness, so is emotion. It's much more complex, much more powerful, much more uh, sticky. Emotions are very sticky, but still they are objects in awareness. Thoughts are very sticky. I mean, just goes, doesn't it, right? So these more sticky objects uh, are, are where our preoccupations are most uh, pronounced. Yeah, that, that, that's obvious. Um, and that's not bad because you have to, if you're making computer chips, you have to preoccupy your mind with engineering solutions. If you're um, planning a, a summer vacation to Rome, you have to make sure it's not too hot and you have to plan and you have to think. So it's not, not none of this is, is right or wrong. It's just that as long as I am preoccupied with that, which is changing and which is contingent and dependent on other things, I'll never realize that which is not dependent on other things, that which is not contingent, that which is truly peaceful. And so the way to do that is to, not constantly be going out into sense objects. So one of the ways we talk about this is the mind, the mind, the mind going out is suffering, is the cause. The result of the mind going out is suffering. So let's say we hear the football game and a lot of loud noise, and we say, oh, it's so noisy. So noisy out there. Why don't it be quiet? That's the mind going out and then complaining. I mean, we don't do that, but it's as, as an example. And then the mind knowing the mind is the cause. And the result of the mind knowing that is the end of suffering. So I notice that I'm, I'm out there with the sound. Why don't it be quiet, all this noise? And then I, oh, 
aversion is like this, or complaining is feels like this, and the mind knowing the mind, that's the end of suffering. Yeah, a very simple model, it's true. Um, and you, and we do this all the time, otherwise we'd be incarcerated somewhere. <laughs> so we're not totally reactive beings, these are natural, natural things. Again, and, and I always like to kind of use simple sense data rather than complex things, because the emotion of fear is sense data. You know, it's still stuff coming and going, but the emotion of fear has much more drawing power. But the principle is the same. So then if like if fear comes up into consciousness, it's an object in awareness. Why, why is it problematic? Um, let's say it's not biological fear, you know, where you, the bear's coming at you. I'm just talking about psychological fear. Uh, biological fear is just natural, but the fear comes up. What's the real problem with fear? It's the thinking. It's not the fear itself. It's the thinking. Because the, the quality of, of fear, or the fear has an unpleasant kind of quality, as in this case, the sound, but the quality is much more strong. And then the thinking mind attaches to it, doesn't it? What am I going to do? What am I gonna do? And that's what we call attachment. And that's, that's the mind going out into fear and becoming fearful. Whereas the mind knowing the mind, oh, fear feels like this. It's still unpleasant. It's still unpleasant. And you might have to act and so on. But let's say you don't have to. It's you just, you know, like you have to give a dhamma talk, right? Like next week, it's your turn kind of thing. And then, you know, oh, read the books. And, you know. and so the, rather than knowing fear is fear, there's the desire to get rid of the fear. And so you prepare the talk and you do everything you can. And then you still have the fear. <laughs> it's, you don't get away with anything. Right? But you say, no, no, okay, I have to give the talk. And I'll, and I'll, just, know, I'll just use the talk to observe fear. They're brilliant. And that's a meditator's um, strategy. So I have to give the talk. What am I going to say? Oh, fear feels this way. Same thing. Fear rises. Fear is unpleasant. I run with it by, by planning the talk. No, nah, cheating. <laughs> fear comes up. Oh, fear feels this way. That's awareness. The mind knowing the mind. It's no longer suffering. It's still unpleasant. But it's still not suffering. This is what we mean by suffering. This kind of getting caught and attached to these different things. So what if you do that a lot? You know, what if you're able to do that a lot? Like meditate. And you're able to touch the silence more and more. Well... When you, when you start to touch the silence of awareness, you need love. That's what you need. Because well, awareness is actually love. But not, I love fish and chips or Mars bars, or I love my mother. Or it's not, it's not sentimental. It's not objective love. It's the capacity to allow all things to arise and cease. So at the center of the spiritual life is love and awareness. Or awareness and love, they're synonymous. And to actually touch that, or realize that it's, it's always there. One ha there has to be the sense of open acceptance of the way things are. Socially, there's always the framework of decency and correctness. That's not, it's, this isn't the social model. The social model is generosity, morality, responsibility, etc., etc. So within that social model, what will come up are things which are not nice, I want to kill my neighbor because they're too loud. They're playing too much uh, pickleball. <laughs> I hear that's a thing now. <laughs> or, 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 right? So it doesn't, doesn't mean by living a moral and good life that the mind has beautiful states of mind. It can be murderous or, or whining or whinging or fearful or doubtful or whatever. But consciousness, if it, you know, consciousness actually never rejects anything. You'd like it to. <laughs> You'd like it to reject this, this stuff, but it doesn't because consciousness accepts all things. It can't. There's, there's no choice. Um, so consciousness, you could see, is love. Now, love is a very difficult word because it has all those other connotations. But think about it. Like, if, 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 uh, if you're meditating, if you're meditating and you want to be quiet, you came here to be quiet. I'm here to be quiet. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing this. And you're meditating, and you start resenting your boss. 
right? Because your boss, you know, called you a turkey or something at work at a meeting or embarrassed you or whatever. So you're meditating, very innocently watching your breath. I hate that guy. I'm going to kill. Oh, no, shut up. I'm meditating now. Be quiet. That's attachment. Whereas love is, oh, this is a feeling of want to murder, murder my boss. <laughs> you don't do it. But but you can see what, what, what we're talking about is this capacity to allow things to come and go totally, totally. And yet not, not really follow them, not, not invest any sense of self in them. They just are as they are. So the feeling of resentment comes up because the person was a creep <laughs> and, and he hurt you, right? And the, so you might think, well, if I was a really good monk, really good Buddhist, I mean, I'd be cool. Nothing would affect me. You know, I just like, no way, man. Who, who lives life like that? We're all affected because we are emotional beings. We're sensitive. So this kind of ideal non-attachment Buddhist, I have met. <laughs> I met a lot of people. Because the emotional life is as it is. There's feelings of hurt. There's feelings of praise and blame. So love then is, is, is or awareness, accepts all things, rejects none. Now, rejecting none or accepting, it doesn't mean you're thinking about them all the time. Because if you're thinking about it, you're not really aware of it. Like if I feel resentment to my boss, and if I'm thinking resentful thoughts, or I'm thinking that I shouldn't have resentful thoughts, I've never accepted it into the mind. I'm just thinking about it. And to accept into the mind ugly things or even thought, like quite often we're trying to get rid of thought in meditation. You can try to get rid of thought, you actually think more. But just the, if you have the presence of mind, it's fine. It's fine, it's fine. You're all constantly receding into the awareness which is loving awareness. But it's not like you love the feeling of resentment. It's the open allowing of this. I, saw, I used to use the word acceptance a lot, but I'm kind of morphing into an old man, maybe. That's the problem, <laughs> soft old manner. But, but I, I, there's something about the English word love which is much, which is much more potent than acceptance because sometimes acceptance can be kind of like re resignation. Oh, I accept it. I hate the guy. He's a creep. Yeah, I accept it. You know, it can be that. But the full, full knowing of this as an object, which is not a threat, which is not who you are, that's not who you are. If you think you are that and you shouldn't be that, then of course you're in trouble. But you are not your thoughts. You know, you're not. Uh, the thoughts is personality. And what's personality? It's just a bunch of reactions from childhood, your gender, you know, all kinds of stuff. It's just a bunch of reactions that come up of causes and conditions. Don't try to perfect your personality. It'll never be perfect. But the deep, it's like it, that, it's that metaphor of the ocean and the waves. You know, the surface, the waves, is where your personality and all the stuff that comes around it. But the deep ocean is the silence behind it. That deep ocean allows all those waves to come and go. So where we sometimes overdo the psychology, I think, of the mind, is we try to perfect the psychology in some way where we're never angry, we're never fearful, we're always just, just always forgiving, be deep compassion for all beings all the time, and we don't eat too many Mars bars, you know. It's the kind of, kind of impossible model of life. But if you, if, if you do your very best, obviously you do your best to not hurt people with speech and action and so on, but then you have this openness. Well, this is life is just that way. Life has negativity. Life has pain. Life has beauty. And then you're starting to, I think, move to that which is the spiritual part, the liberating part of the teaching. And and going back to this idea of preoccupation and availability, you can see how I can be preoccupied with the very moral things very good things, creative things, making things and so on. But if my mind is always on objects, always in like planning and doing and creating and that, and it has no, it has no real time to reflect in silence, then liberation becomes unavailable. That deep insight, that deep silence of, of the deep ocean becomes unavailable because you're not available. You're busy, 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 busy. But once that, once that, that, that once you trust in awareness and you really begin to trust in awareness and you start to spend some time in not doing, 
not even meditating, right? Because that can be a, another part of the list you have to do. But you actually allow the mind just to be the way it is, sit in awareness, and this is, these things are coming, going in awareness. That is so refreshing. And, and, and then actually life becomes much more productive and much more available to other things. It's not like you're concentrating the mind to get your mind to some like this really kind of ethereal state, trying to perfect that and, and keep it and maintain it. And then leave me alone. I'm meditating. <laughs> I'm trying to get enlightened. Get out of here. But you talk too loud. That's not what we're doing. That ain't it at all. That's just refinement. So people sometimes mistake refinement for liberation, but a refined state of mind changes to a coarse state of mind. And then you say, oh, it can't be refinement. Silence is not refinement. It's hard to see. It's hard to see, but it's not the same as refinement of emotion or, or like, like emotionally, I can have a, a very refined and subtle feeling of joy for someone, or I can have a coarse emotion like oh, I'm really angry at them. But silence that doesn't really have that kind of a quality in it. Yeah? Uh, and then it, if we allow that silence to function, if we trust in that awareness, and then, then we find we're always reacting to things. And we're going to say, well, that's a reaction. And we keep opening the mind and opening the mind and letting go. And that takes you to this deep, deep silence, the deep silence of the heart. That's why we say it's the, sometimes we say it's the unshakable deliverance of the heart. That's how sometimes it's phrased in Theravada Buddhism. So, you know, I don't know where you're at with your own practices. Sometimes the practice is just making it through a day and not yelling at anyone. You've got the flu, you've got too many responsibilities, and you just have a bank overdraft. Okay, this is a bad day. <laughs> and you deal with that, right? You, you deal with that. Sometimes it's just being mindful enough not to say anything really harmful. Okay. But if you can get some spaces in your, in your life, and I'm always selling this, especially in the morning. Morning is, the, is just a, such, a, such an interesting time if you're a meditator, because in the morning, any, any, like as a contemplative, I always have themes that I'm processing or contemplating in the back of my consciousness. Some themes which relate to my own understanding and, and the kind of Buddhist path. And, and those are good things because they're a kind of background reflection going on in the midst of the complexity of life. It might be, you know, it might be just the silence of the mind, it might be love, it might be the reactivity that I have around people. And, and those are important aspects, I think, of the spiritual life, that it isn't just some technique that you do, but rather it's a whole 24-7 contemplation of, of your own existence and what you're working on, say, as a way of talking. Um, so morning practice, if you can, if you have enough time and enough energy, et cetera, et cetera, um, and you can do a really good chunk of meditation, then that sets you up. Not, it's not just a tranquilizing exercise. It's a kind of informing your, 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 your inner working, your inner contemplative life into what's going on now and, and how you might work with it during the day. And then that information makes you more mindful. That, that contemplation makes you more mindful. That, 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 and that contemplation or that working on whatever you're doing gives you a kind of a, a, a direction in the day. If you wake up and you're just like, you're running on a clock, obviously you brush your teeth and you have a sandwich and you're running and your mind is just helter skelter. And, and you haven't, which is which is not bad. I mean, it happens, but the contemplative part of your um, experience hasn't been nurtured, hasn't fed. Sometimes the evenings are good, but most people are just whacked out at the end of the day. You know, just oh, just give me a movie or something. I can't. I'm so tired, right? And fair enough. Something like what do you call it? Um, uh, you veg out, right? And it, it's understandable, right? There's nothing wrong with that. So the morning. Uh, I mean, maybe you know, some people, night people, some are morning people where monasteries are usually, you know, we're up at three or four in the morning. So, um, but there's something about that morning time. It's not just about a, a duty to meditate, but it is actually creating the intentions in your mind 
to understand yourself in a, in a, in a profound and deep way. But I'm always selling that. I'm always saying morning meditation, do morning meditation, but it, it's really paid dividends for me. So that's why I like it. All right, I think that's sufficient. So I'll end there. You want to do the ending note? <clears throat> Any questions for anyone? Mira, can you hand me that water? Or Andre, can you hand me that? Oh, you read my mind. So, prost. <laughs> uh, any questions, first of all, from us in the room? Yes, please, yes. Great. So I'm just, just in case they didn't pick it up. So the questionnaire is just saying that they appreciated seeing the difference between unpleasant and suffering, which was helpful. Okay. <clears throat> something about sobriety and fear you mentioned something about like there's nothing more fearful about being intoxicated i just didn't really understand the connection is it okay if you explain yeah that? so the my my take on sobriety well i've seen so much you know destruction from alcoholism from you know overdosing and all that kind of stuff both in families and the people who get caught up into it, that um, to go down that road is a very fearful thing, both for a family and for an individual. And, and you know, when I've talked to families who have, I know a few who have sons who have, you know, really on hard drugs, and I thought, oh my gosh, the stuff they have to go through, and the person too. So that is a very fearful realm to, to, to um, end up in. And, and so by, by being sober and promoting sobriety in, in culture, we, we help culture uh, from those you know, kind of fearful experiences going down that lane. And, and then like, I think Tibetans say that <laughs> that's the worst of the five precepts to break, because once you break that one, you'll break all five. <laughs> but, you know, you think it was killing or something like that, but. But it is a it's, a, it's a horrific thing in the human culture. And it's always been there, these various kinds of addictions and uh, various ways that can, can happen. And it is frightening in that sense. So I say to my parents, I mean, my parents are gone. And I was a, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do drugs. Like when I was experimenting with drugs as a young person, I mean, I didn't tell them, but they kind of said, oh, what's he doing? I must have come home starry-eyed, right? You imagine the fear they had. As a young guy, I had to do it. And so, so if, if I had been more wise, I would have said, "Oh, the water's coming through." We just have a bit of a open window. We need to close, slam her down. So uh, that's the kind of, you know, where I'm coming from. But, but you know, sometimes like the word morality doesn't. I know people don't like it, but so you know. The, the Buddha described it in this way of, you know, lessening fear in beings because we're not going to go in these directions. Yeah? How, like, what is, like, um, is one beer bad? I don't know. I haven't had one beer for a long time. I'd probably be on the floor. <laughs> but that's, that's a personal choice. But um, it also is a kind of... Uh, because these these are these are reflections that individuals pick up the way they want. They're not absolutes, but um, you know, someone who's who's just known not to drink alcohol is just have, you know doesn't have to explain themselves. They just know he doesn't do that. Leave him alone, kind of thing. Um, marijuana is legal now. 
Uh, I wouldn't want anyone to go to prison for marijuana, but would I want one of the one of our workers to be smoking while they're building the meditation hall? No, thanks. <laughs> I want good work, right? So um, these are things are always going to be discussed in society. But I think the more we just like as you as the meditator, you really don't want to alter. You don't want to create more objects, more more uh, intense objects, more. Because I tried LSD and I, you know, all kind of, that kind of stuff, and boy, that is some an intense object. <laughs> and and that, you know, that's you know, although people say they had these wonderful opening experience, fine, but the work actually, the hard work of calming the mind down um, is very boring. Very, very, my meditation is so boring. <laughs> you know, it's blah, 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 the mind going on. And then if you then alter the mind into something interesting, I don't think that's going to help the meditation. I don't know. Having said that, now there's some interesting experiments from Harvard or John Hopkins on psilocybin to deal with depression. If it works, great. You know, it's great, you know, because these are, these aren't, you know, these, someone who has like deep issues of depression or abuse and so on. It's very hard to be mindful of that. So these um, experiments that are going on in culture, great, you know, but just just to excite the mind uh, is very counterproductive because it'll be harder actually to be just with the boring, you know, and just to come back to the silence of the mind in, in the ordinary rather than the extraordinary, my take on it. So when, um, when we see a young, young, young guy maybe wants to come to the monasteries and hasn't had much meditation, I just take my glasses off. Because <laughs> they're so restless. You know, want to do something. Yeah, and then we have lots of work, so we certainly keep people busy. And then hey, if you want to meditate, meditate. If you don't want to meditate, meditate. You got to come to the meditation. And then they watch restlessness. And I certainly had that as a young man. I had no experience in meditation at all. And then you know, we're sitting on concrete floors for two hours. I want to go. I don't want to be here. And it, it wasn't a sweet experience. But the teacher says, just be mindful of pain. Be mindful of aversion. Be mindful of restlessness. And, and so actually, although the experience wasn't, it's all peaceful. Or it's all blissful. The reference was always awareness, rather than the objects of awareness. And I didn't understand. I just had faith in my teacher, and and I had strong, strong role models. You know, men who really were very from agricultural backgrounds. Who were, they were tough, but not in a. They had a very, they had a lovely gentility, but they're very, very strong. So they could sit for hours and hours and hours, and I was just kind of this Westerners jumping around, but. So I had really good role models, very good help, but it was very, very difficult. I'm glad I did it. You know, I'm glad I didn't just keep smoking weed. <laughs> you know, the guy could have, you know, I couldn't do that much longer. <laughs> but that result, that was a very bad result in my mind. You know, it didn't create any kind of uh, emotional stability or whatever. It created bad results. So I pretty soon dropped that. It's a big topic. In culture is a very, very, very big topic. Any other questions, anyone? Yes. Thank you so much for being here with us. <laughs> wonderful food to sit in community together. What I found my mind intrigued about and wanting to hear more on was uh, you talking about Kalyana Mita and spiritual friendship. As a practice. As a practice. So the question is on Kalyanamita as a practice. So well my my experience of Kalyanamita is monasteries and friends of monasteries. So is there any way I could have liked all the monks I lived with? Impossible, right? We're not clones, we're eccentrics. <laughs> we're the opposite of clones. Anyone that's gonna do this is gonna be a bit weird. <laughs> right? But we're all good hearted and um, we all aspire to realize Nibbana. That's part of the, 
kind of aspiration. So then you have uh, a group of men. I've always lived in men's communities, so my relationship to women have been from the laity, but the lived-in community has always been men. Um, and then within that, you have like standards of speech, standards of, of, of deportment, you have seniority, um, sharing of resources. And so there's some very good guidelines for social etiquette. Then, of course, you find out that the guy next to you is the last guy you wanted to sit next to you. I mean, you didn't come to the monastery for that, uh, as an exaggeration. And all your problems are him. <laughs> monastery is fine. It's just him. <laughs> and, of course, what's going on is projection. You're stuck in a monastery. You like to do your own thing, can't do your own thing. You are doing your own thing, but you can't do your own thing. And then aversion arises around this person. But because you have this kind of sense of Kalyanamitta, that you're both on the path together, you take responsibility for the aversion, obviously. And as you take for responsibility for the aversion, your, your, your capacity to be in the world expands. Because now you've, you, 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 you basically, I've got to include this guy. I'm going to see him every morning. <laughs> Um, it hasn't happened so extremely to me, but you know that that's the idea. So the inclusion of all manner of humanity, if if it's not abusive, if it's not etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's why I say we live in a kind of. Um, then you see what what is what is kalyanamitta? It's not just someone I like. It's also someone I can listen to who maybe irks me or whatever or get a different perspective on his, what he's working on or uh, whatever dharma he has. And so I work through the rough spots with him and then we live this life together and now we're kalyanamitta because we've gone through our personal warfares and our struggles and all of that uh, in a way which is always according to dharma rather than according to personality. And, and so now I have you know, having lived in monasteries, I have some really deep friendships. And I don't, like, I visited the monk in, 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 uh, in Italy, and I, I was part of his ordination 40 years ago. And I met him as a student, and, and we, you know, we see each other every five years. But, ah, oh, yeah. And, and why? Well, not just that we were friends then, but we've done the work. And he's been an abbot for 25 years, and that's a hard slog. <laughs> and, and, you know, so there's that common, common ground, or Ajahn Shichito, or Ajahn Bajiro in, in Portugal. So any, I mean, family would be that way or whatever. But if, if, if relationships are based just on personality, that's part of it. And obviously there's some monks who I'm simpatico with and some they don't, you know, not so much. We're all calling it a mitta. We're all, we're all spiritual friends in that way. And so I've certainly learned by being with monks who are inspiring, monks who are irksome, monks who confuse me, monks who edify me. Um, and, and so that's, that's the way I've developed a whole sense of Kalyanamitta. And then with lay people now more with teaching, then that has been so rewarding for me because people really trust me sometimes with their personal stories it's like you know I, think, I don't even know you and they're and they're and they're saying very very deep things so and i really honor that and so then because i'm honoring that as as a as a friend spiritual friend and trying to see you know how i could be of help then i got a lot of insight because I just I can only have so many experiences of life, but like any therapist, I suppose, right? Same kind of thing. Um, they so I get a lot of insight and a lot of friendship and, and, and joy from that. So in 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 Buddhism, I think in relation in the way of relationships, there are. I don't think I've I don't know if I've read this, but there's three things which make a good relationship. <laughs> okay, one is, is the, the level of morality. So both 
if there's a partnership, if both of them are bank robbers, they'll do well. <laughs> if both have a good sense of ethics, they'll do well. If one is a bank robber and one is very ethical, it's not going to go good. Okay. <laughs> the second way is that both have the same level of generosity. So both are mean spirited. They'll kind of get on. If both of them are generous, they'll get on. But if one is mean spirited and one is generous, it's not going to work. Take it for what it is. But the last one is a more interesting one. If both are like the, the, the contemplation of Dhamma, if both are very worldly and not reflective, they'll probably get on, you know, they'll get on a cruise or something like that. <laughs> if, if, and eat. Uh, if both are reflective, I mean, there's more chance that they work their stuff out, not guarantee. Uh, but if one is very worldly and one is reflective, they may stay together, right? But their Dharma work will not be one. That doesn't mean that they're Buddhist reflective, right? That they are reflective, that they think about things they are not just superficial. So that's one way of thinking about Kalyanamitta. But the, 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 the sense of a, if a person triggers my buttons, then I've got a chance to look at the buttons is obviously very, very important for, for kind of developing a, a broader sense of your, of your human possibility. I've never been married. I've never had kids. So I'm a, you know, there's, those are higher practices. I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Like kids, oh, that's such sadhu. I mean, it's, it seems so difficult. <laughs> Like I like my brother has, he's got lovely kids and well not kids anymore. But I've like I never even thought, how could I do that? I don't even know my own mind. <laughs> I don't know if that's an answer, but you know, some thoughts on it. Are there any questions from the folk? No, nothing. Okay, Jane has one. Yeah, please. Uh, so. You were talking about monastics will get up at three or four in the morning, yeah? Yeah, well, go sleep early. Yeah, well, then I was thinking that, like, how, so let's say, how, how is it looked upon? Like, what if someone is, you know, really tired because they didn't sleep the night before or whatever? And I'm thinking of that in terms of, you know, our own practice, like, okay, so maybe I had a night where I didn't get any sleep or I didn't get much sleep. And then it's like, am I still going to get up and meditate? Anyway, just how do you, how well, good health is the first thing. Good health is the, is foremost. So if someone's not sleeping well, I just ask them, "What's up? You know, what's up? You okay?" You know, so for sure, for sure, that's the first thing. But they do have to adjust to the monastic discipline, and and so if they like, if they let's say if someone wants to ordain, and and they say, "Well, I I just can't get up that early." Well, I say, "You can't be a monk." Straight up, right? It's not like this is not negotiable. Well, I, you know, my my best time is at eight. Can can you can I have a breakfast at eight thirty? Like a, how about a bacon and egg sandwich with with? <laughs> uh, sorry, Jack. So you know, someone who signs up has to kind of be able physically to to do the work and and so on and so forth. But then within that, there's lots of times like someone has. Limes and they just barely make it for lunch. So we take care of them. So health is so ter terribly important. Um, or someone said coffee too late in the day and they, you know, or something like that. I do that sometimes. So there's, it's not, it's not, it's not a police state. You know, you sign up because you want to do this. You want to do this and you want the encouragement of your, of your fellow monastics. And there was a lot of compassion, you know, there's a lot of caring and, and, and sensitivity to um, like young guys maybe needing more sleep or guys like me needing less sleep and, and, and all of that. So we really look out for that. But it is very inspiring to be with a group of meditators. That, like we start, our morning meditation starts at five. And, and to be in a nice shrine room and, and, and to do the chanting and to hear the silence of the mind is a tremendously uplifting. And most of us really, really like it in that way. Otherwise, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't be a monk, right? Yeah. So in terms of that, you do the best you can. Um, but having said that, as a monastic, I don't, I don't have to go to work. <laughs> you 
you know, I'm not a taxi driver. If I've had a bad night, ooh, this is dangerous. If I had a bad night, I'm, I'm just a wreck the next day. This is fine. <laughs> you can be a wreck the next day. So we don't have those pressures of performance that, I mean, the only performance really is to get the meal out by midday. So we don't, we, we don't live a very pressured life. We live a life of, of, of purification sometimes where, you know, there's no pressure, but oh, angers will come up, fears will come up because now there's no distraction. So that's the difficult part of early monasticism is now there's no distraction and any, a lot of material that hasn't been looked at starts to come up. Sometimes as sickness, sometimes as resentment or fear. And then we say, oh, good, he's finally arrived. <laughs> yeah, and, and we actually, we had a novice in one of the monasteries. He was just too inspired. He said, oh, he, he, you, you like this? <laughs> and so we delayed his ordination until he hit a down spot. I said, okay, let's see how you do that. It was very important because he, you have to hit a down spot. Anyone been married? <laughs> so, you know, the honeymoon inspiration is impossible to be permanent. And so this particular, it was lovely. Chat. And we weren't, we weren't cruel, you know. You know, we didn't beat him. We're, we were very kind to him. That's why he liked it, maybe. <laughs> but then we hit the down spot. We say, okay, okay, you're not inspired now. Do you still want to be a monk? Right. You still want to do this. And got through that, and yeah, he became a monk. And we felt much more confident because there's something too bright-eyed, bushy-tailed about him. It wasn't like <laughs> hardcore monasticism. <laughs> yeah. We knew it. Yeah, it's just took a, most it comes, you know, within a month. <laughs> no, I don't know. But things do come up. Material does come up. And then what happens is these the morning meditation becomes very fruitful because now you just look at it, you can't distract, you can't distract with the work, and that becomes incredibly uh, powerful for establishing awareness around something that one hasn't wanted to deal with. And so the difficult material is the way you actually develop more mindfulness rather than just the easy material. So now I have to be aware of fear or, or resentment or the guy next to me or whatever it is. But with sleep and things like that, monks will experiment with sleep and they'll make it a problem. And, you know, I'm only going to sleep two hours. And then their, then their meditation is their heads on the floor. And, you know, then they go through stuff like that. And then they kind of find a more balanced. Yeah. Is that, yeah? Yeah. No, okay. Uh, yeah. It was more yeah, like I know in the, I came from a Zen tradition where it was like. No, 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 no. We're, we, <laughs> um, we're pussycats. <laughs> like Zen, from what Jim has told me, they, and from what I've been in, in a Zendo, they come around, the Jiggy Jitsu comes around with a stick, right? And, well, well, that's the Zendo I was in. So he's walking back and forth behind us, our faces to the wall. And I'm petrified. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to fall asleep. Oh. Uh, but, but actually, it's a very good system because they just hit the acupuncture point. So I kind of respected what they were doing. We just let them fall asleep. <laughs> so Theravada's actually not very good for that. You know, if someone falls asleep, okay. <laughs> I think Zen is actually better for that. <laughs> any, are there any questions from the folk uh, on Zoom? But just uh, back to that, Jane, I, I think, I think um, when, when I became uh, 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 an abbot say, many years ago, I certainly, it, it brought out the inner Nazi in me. <laughs> you know, okay, you guys obey me. But that was fear, right? It was just fear. Fortunately, we have a whole system where the guy in power, he's just another monk. So he doesn't really have absolute power. So... So then I watched that, that kind of trying to run this like a police state. It didn't last long, but I could see it come up because of fear. 
because I, you know, I want singing. I want you know, come on time. And you know, this isn't the way to live life. This is horrible. And and you know, monks are pretty tolerant for a while. Then they vote with their feet and leave. <laughs> So, oh, that's what happens when you are in, oh, when you have authority, this is what does to your mind. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So we say the, the defilement of fame or the defilement of authority only comes when there is fame and authority. And it comes power, power corrupts and power, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, is that the phrase? Something like that. And, and, but the Sangha, Kalyanamitta, now is like if the senior monk is kind of going off, we have meetings, we say, hey, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a mate. I'm not an inmate. <laughs> that was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> I like that. Anyway, so that's a kind of learning curve that anyone in leadership, you know, kind of goes through. Um, so that, you know, when a monastery is run in that way, they're, they're total failures. Only one or two monks will stay. And people just, because you know, in, in Asia more, there is a more hierarchical structure and there's more obedience that way, but Western is a very egalitarian in that way. So I had to learn that lesson. That was horrible, but I learned it. Andre. Hey, Bob, thank you so much for being with us. I, I hesitated to ask the question because I'd like you to get a good night's sleep. Oh, it's all right. Um, I can drink lots of coffee tomorrow morning. <laughs> You, you spoke about um, awareness and love synonymously. Yes. As a sort of, um, as a way of kind of doing an end run around acceptance. Yes. And I really, this resonates very much with me. And I've also heard um, teachers kind of like separate these things. Yeah. Right? So you, you, you teach mindfulness and then you teach Metta. Like kindness to teach metta, and then it's kind of like now you've got something more than you had before. But I, I've never. Anyway, I wanted you to say some more about this because I think it's. So Andre is asking about my comments on awareness and love being synonymous. I think that's come later, but I never, I never felt teaching metta as a technique. I never could do that because I always felt that well. So, so when you divide Buddhism into its social constructs of conventional truth, I'm here, you're there, then you have that idea, may you be well, may I be well. But when you're looking at Buddhism as stream of consciousness, observation of stream of consciousness, then metta, and, and where I learned that was with fear, that I had to have metta or loving kindness for the fear, right? So it wasn't about the other monk, the monk who stood beside me, he's taking a beating today. <laughs> it, it was about the, the, very the very arising of unpleasant phenomena, which had to be treated with kindness. And that very early on was my definition of metta. So I saw these techniques and I, I could see them be helpful, but I could never really go there. I thought, no, I mean, I could go there and, and it was helpful. But what was more fruitful for me was in stream of consciousness, there are unpleasant things which arise and they need to be welcomed. And that's a commonplace in psychology now, you know, give, give your fears a cup of tea and so on. But this was 50 years ago and uh, I, didn't, I didn't really understand that. Andre and Samir says, no, you, have to, you have to love your fear. Well, of course. And then that, oh yeah, the show awareness is love in that case. And, 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 and then I got very interested in silence and then I don't think I integrated that love into the silence as much, but I kept going back to that. I kept going back to the heart chakra, feeling that, you know, and, and then more and more, oh, yeah, yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's just awareness. We're just love. We're just awareness. We're just love. We're consciousness. And that's where language gets very, very difficult. Very difficult. You know, that's where you really have to stop thinking. Don't think about it. <laughs> and, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's not just fulfilling, it's just right. It's not like a personal, no, it's dharma. Like dharma's that way. It's not, it's not personal in that, you know, like that way. Or, and it's not like an experience you get and then you try to reconstruct. Wow, I had a meditation last night. Wow, it was so great. I saw the day. <laughs> it's, you know, it has a different kind of, 
the reality. It is reality. Yeah. Um, so these are, you know, these are things that evolved in my own understanding. First one was the, you know, that understanding of fear. And then, like, I remember, you've, you've heard my story so many times, but in, there was, in that first two years, I was I had, at one period of a lot of rage. You know, I just want to kill everyone. And uh, so then I do a lot of walking meditation. I go to a person, and I, oh, I do so much metta bhava, and I'm trying to get rid of this rage. He said, what? No, no, just swear. <laughs> well, obviously, I just swear. Huh? Okay. But then stop. <laughs> and then notice, oh, rage feels this way. Ah, I see. You're making it mindful by welcoming it. You know, I wasn't really believing it. I didn't go, you know, I was, I'm a decent fellow. <laughs> but because I was doing metta bhavana as a technique of suppression. In other words, I was averse to the rage. May you be well, may you be well. May you be, you know, so it was totally <laughs> productive. But, I mean, that's what the technique says. The book says when you have anger, then you do metta. Yeah, it's true. But I was doing metta with ignorance. Right? I was doing metta with delusion, with ego, or trying to get rid of. So then I could see, yeah, okay, I can see this perception I have of this person is very full of judgment. And then I could shift my mind, yeah, but actually he's keeping precepts. Then it could start to make the shift, but it wasn't no longer from may you be well, may you be well. It's actually a shift of perception from judgment to one of another, another part of him. And that takes more skill. It takes much, much more skill. So those early insights pretty much gave me the, the background for seeing the perf that, that awareness has to have that is that, you know, it's again, it's not, he's tried to separate it out, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You, do you teach that a lot? I like to teach inclusiveness, equanimity, like in, in my tradition, the, the translation is inclusiveness. Okay. Dhamma Vijaya. Separation, non-duality. Right. So I think, I think love and non-duality are, are are one of a piece. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you want to develop love, try this mantra for six months. <laughs> I love you. I have always loved you. I will always love you. Do that for six months. And then send me a note. <laughs> now, that can sound very sentimental. So if you're a cynic, you'll say, whoa, I don't know. I just told someone that I was very cynical. I said, why don't you try that? Say, oh, I couldn't do that. It's not personal. It's not personal. <laughs> this, this isn't sort of orthodox, but well, what do you mean by I? What do you mean by you? Or, you know, you get into language, but it actually goes beyond language. So that's a really good antidote to, antidote, not that. Anyway, it's very good for all the Vibhava Tanha we have. We have a lot of pushing away and judging. There's a lot that goes on underneath. We're not even aware of it. So whatever, yeah. I love you. I've always loved you. I will always love you. Move around fear, around all your stu stupid comments about your body size. And you begin to see that, well, who is that? Who is that talking? And it all just kind of morphs into love is awareness. But you have to do it a long time, or you have to, these things you have to give it a try. Oh, okay, six months, do it a month, see what happens. And like constantly, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to, I mean, this isn't a police state. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I said, you must do that. Any, any other, any questions from the, Oh, I'm going to answer the question. Huh. It happens, yeah. Thirdly, uh, has asked if you have any insight on dreams. No. <laughs> I don't. 
Next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the person that had their hand up is re raised. <laughs> they can go ahead. Hi, John. Um, I heard a teacher once say that a we're, person we're looking at the computer can live with questions. anyone. We're just figuring the sound. <laughs> you could just say no. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Are they writing it out? Can I go ahead? Oh, yes, please. Oh, um, I once heard a teacher say that a person with virtue can live with anyone. I wonder if you agree and if you have any thoughts on that. Well, it's one of those abstracts that is actually useless. <laughs> You know, what, what does that actually mean? I can live with anyone. I don't know. If I had to live with Putin, could I live with them? Am I virtuous? So, I mean, what's what's the point of the question? Um, what would that, how would your virtue help you live with people who are different or difficult? Can you personalize that question? Um, can you make it part of your practice? in your life? Um, just living with people with different views on subjects, you know, maybe somebody has a racist attitude or doesn't okay. like to, um, doesn't like to think in a way that is compassionate. And and you have to live near them, or someone has to live near them. Yes. They have no choice. Okay. That helps. Well, um, if you have social choices to live with Kalyanamitta, then do so. If you have if you're living if someone is living where our people are abusive, then get out of there. Um, so that we all know. But then rather than idealize how you would deal with a person like this, you just have to face the reality of how your mind does react to this person. So take out the idealism that I should be virtuous and that I won't react and begin to notice how you do react. So you, I don't know, if you can dialogue, you dialogue and so on. But let's say in this case, there's no dialogue, then your practice becomes, why, why is this sound that's coming at me suffering? If it's abusive sound, I know, okay, this is dangerous. And if it's physical abuse, it's dangerous. But if there is no physical danger and you have the freedom to come and go, then there's a chance to say, well, okay, this is sound. This is unpleasant sound. Um, I don't like it. Uh, but I don't seem to be able to change the person's mind. Okay, so what's the cause of suffering? And the cause of suffering is I don't want this person to be that way. Now, I'm putting that in the context of that one does object to all these things. So I'm not saying you don't do that. right? I'm not saying you just have to be a doormat and say, oh, may you be well and happy, you racist creep. I'm mean, No. <laughs> but, you know, so, so all of that's in place. So let's not get, you know, let's not say I'm just saying being uh, complacent, but all that in place, then your inner work is what's the cause of suffering? And the cause of suffering is in this case, I don't want this person to speak in that way. That's the wanting. And it's rational, it's reasonable, and everyone will agree with you, but still, that's the cause of suffering. It's not them that's causing your suffering, 
it's you're wanting them not to be that way. And if you don't get that one right, you you you. I mean, if you you'll never be free because this person's going to be who they are. Uh, and then you watch. Then you use that that very interchange to watch aversion. It shouldn't be this way. And and begin to see it as an object in mind, the emotional reaction as an object that's coming up. And you try to have a sense of loving kindness towards that object of aversion or resentment or horror or disgust or whatever it might come up. Oh, disgust feels this way. Huh? So your mind is opening to something disgusting. Again, I'm not saying that you don't say something. I'm not saying that. Uh, and, and, and then your, your awareness has to expand actually to include even this. If you can, if you can also see that this person is suffering, that any person who lives in a racist hating mind does, it lives in hell. That's sometimes hard to see. That's hard to see because it's just so offensive, so offensive and, and you're reactive. But if you have enough distance to know your own reaction first, and then you can see, what would it be like to live in that mind? You know, what would it, whoa, that's really suffering. And this isn't kind of mamby pambying him, oh, you poor thing, you're suffering. It's not that, it's, it's very personal. You so, on, on, a, on a verbal level, you would never agree with it or never condone it. But on the inner level, wow, that's really suffering. So you get to a sense of love again, as, you, again, the word acceptance here is difficult because it sounds like you agree. So when you use the word, or you use the word love, I love this guy, you don't. You don't like him, but the awareness then can contain this very offensive and difficult being. And maybe, maybe your heart begins to feel, wow, yeah, you're really suffering. And you don't say it to the person, right? But you feel it. And then you have a chance to maybe, maybe the way you're responding, maybe will have some effect. Maybe it won't have some effect. But you have a way now responding, which isn't just your reaction. Now, this might take a long time, but your inner work would be very fortified and, and enhanced by being able to do this. I'm not saying everyone could do this. It's, 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 it's not easy. It's not easy. And, and I generally, I say to, to people, if someone's toxic, get out of there. Because most of us aren't strong enough to handle that kind of level of toxicity. Get out of there. You can get overwhelmed by that. But if there's no choice, there's no choice. So please don't take this as some kind of passive, but since your question is that way, what can you do uh, in terms of meditation? I would kind of think that's the, what you try to do. Does that help? Yes, that helped a lot. Yes? Thank you. Okay, bon chance. <laughs> Or whatever, right? That's a result of causes and conditions. Exactly, yeah. So the compassion is for that as well. And just the recognition. Of yes. The That's the very good point. That that the reason the person is coming out in his hateful, racist ways because causes and conditions in their childhood, in their culture. So if you're able to see, hmm. The abused becomes the abuser, maybe that kind of, it's a very, very helpful way of then really. Uh, yeah, but they are there. Yeah, and that's a very good point. Yeah, so how to look at their humanity. But sometimes, you know, our, 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 you know, our hackles get up so strongly. But if you're, if you're willing then to see, well, this is a lesson I need to learn and not condone that, then it becomes contemplative. Yeah, contemplative. Yeah, thank you for that. Showtime? Yeah, set two. Should we finish with the meta chant or can we get that up? This is what should be done. Thank you everyone for being here. We'll do, we'll finish with the chant on loving kindness. This is what should be done. We're getting that up on the screen.
supposed to be doing the session. He got me. Um, yeah, he's got a, a bad fever right now, so he's sick. So he asked me to do this. So here we are. So thanks for your attention and see you next time. And on behalf of everyone here and those um, not here that are watching, um, our thanks that you were able to fill in for um, Tana Mercier. And we also want to send him our good wishes and hope that he gets better soon. But also just really appreciating your um, just wonderful talk, but also just um, your very human way of answering our questions that, you know, we can understand and they can um, kind of get into our own hearts and help us to understand how this practice works. So thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> oh, and three bows to be yes. Right. Uh, respect with three bows. Anyone would like to pay respects with three bows, please go ahead. <clears throat> Okay, see you next time.